Well, welcome back to Spotlight. I'm here with uh, my two guests, Dr. Zulmary. Is that Zulmary? Zulmary. Zulmary. Okay, Zulmary. Ortiz Vivera and Reverend Guillermo Escalona from Baptist Health, South Florida. Well, welcome to Spotlight. Thank you for having us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yes. And welcome to the BVI. Beautiful BVI. Yeah. Is it first time? First time. Second time, actually. Sec me. Second time, please. Okay. And you guys are here to give uh, a lecture. Uh, is it a lecture, a workshop, combination of both? What? Um, a series of lectures. A series of lectures. On uh, end of life and uh, palliative care and uh, health and wellness. Yeah. And that's going to be, well, that started, it started today? We did our first lecture today, okay. and it will continue tomorrow. Okay. So the first lecture today was for the healthcare uh, professionals. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Yes. And then tomorrow uh, evening is to, well, it's an evening, right? From four from four thirty. Okay. Yes. That would be for the general public. That's correct. Everyone's, Everyone's welcome, Everyone. professionals included, but of course the general uh, public. We look forward to meeting them. Okay, and that is at the, uh, the, the training division? I believe it's in the government center. The, tra the training division in the Betito Fred building? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, and it starts at 4.30 and it goes to, it starts at 6. Okay, it starts at 6 and it goes to 8. <laughs> okay. get, the, get the designs from the peanut, from the peanut gallery. <laughs> it's not okay. Cool. Let me um, let me get to my my notes. Say yes. It starts at six and it ends at it ends at eight, and that's open to to the public. And you'll be talking about uh, end of end of end of life and estate planning. Now, we 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 were hearing words like. Uh, Palliative care, which is a word I heard from the first time when I got this email. Uh, what is that? So um, I'm glad you asked um, <laughs> because you, you mentioned end of life. And um, end of life is part of palliative care, but it's not uh, all of it. Um, we are a service that helps people with chronic illnesses. Um, we see patients with cancer, with congestive heart failure, um, renal disease. Um, these are patients that have been dealt a huge blow to their health. And what we concentrate on is um, diminishing their pain, having their symptoms controlled, and establishing a report with a family, whoever is the social structure of this patient, um, have them involved in early symptom management. Um, as we establish this relationship and the chronic illness um, takes its natural course, um, we are able to have this rapport with the family whenever we need to make very tough medical decisions when they're in the end stage of their illness, mm -hmm. we are able to do so. But the, the huge difference between palliative care and the hospice movement as, is that we're there upon diagnoses and we journey with the patient. Whereas hospice care or end of life, as you've referred to it, is, is more when you have six months or less within, within that chronic illness. Okay. So you uh, essentially guide a person, uh, well, make them comfortable on their way to die, on their way to death. Exactly. And Which is a journey that we're all on. Yeah. Uh, and may surprise us at any, may be accelerated at any given time. We could be a, a child or a 20-year-old, and we might think that, uh, and when that happens, of course, it's painful because there's a sense in which we lose the future. With the aged, we, we tend to lose the past, although we want to have all of our loved ones forever, but to be alive is to become death eligible. Mm. No, one leaves, no one lives forever, no one leaves here alive. And the beauty of palliative care is that it focuses not only on life-threatening illnesses, but also life-limiting, uh, chronic illness, and addresses uh, the problem of suffering, mm -hmm. which we could call total pain, where the person is experiencing a physical affliction, but there are also psychological aspects and social aspects and spiritual aspects. Spirituality, you could call it, if 
an existential crisis when your resources are overwhelmed. Uh, the great reformer Martin Luther put it this way, we don't truly pray until we run out of rope. Mm. And palliative care is one of those services that's there to collaborate with the Creator and the people that we love to help our loved ones be as comfortable as they can as they struggle with this life-limiting chronic illness all the way until the end stage. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and as you mentioned, along with the, the physical pain, uh, it m must be, I suspect, a uh, traumatic experience uh, that you're going to, to leave this earth and, uh, and perhaps there perhaps some fears that are creeping into your mind. And, and I suspect, Reverend, uh, Reverend Guillermo, that's where uh, you would come in. Yes, because uh, what, we what, what, what your experience has been with uh, persons, with dying persons, that must be quite an interesting experience for you. Yes, as we become diminished, uh, we, we become aware of anticipatory grief because we experience uh, smaller losses on the way to the greatest of all losses. The little deaths that happen, for instance, the loss of, uh, because of, of diminished capacity, the loss of a hobby, a pastime, the inability to engage a pet like we used to, the inability to be as active in our homes as we once were. All of those are losses that are conducive to grief because all change produces a measure of loss and grief. But when we lose those, those physical faculties, when they become diminished, our psychological acuity, our cognitive skills. I remember a, a young man, he was 20 years old, he wanted to be a veterinarian and work with his father in the Amazon. He had great hopes and he was uh, taking karate lessons, developed great pain in his legs and then realized that it was a cancer. It wasn't due to the karate. And he told me, uh, my greatest regret is that the plans that I had made for the, mm -hmm. next, the next 20 years are not going to be realized. So we walked with him, we journeyed with him. The, it's a team, the, the physician, the, the nursing staff, the the it's a less, holistic yeah, approach. Yeah, holistic to approach, medicine. whole person care, mm -hmm. to find meaning and purpose as well as physical comfort throughout that journey. And then when death does come, that it would happen in the most comfortable, peaceful, uh, meaningful way where not only are the, are the professionals engaged and fully present, making themselves available as healers, not only with technology, but as humane individuals who care, but also the friends and the family. This experience to me has truly affirmed the value of friends, family, and faith. Mm. Uh, those three dynamics rise to the occasion. And when you've got medical care providers that also are a part of that, that become like part of the family, that are part of that social support, that are fully present, and it's pretty hard not to be spiritual, whatever your discipline, when you're dealing with these ultimate concerns. Now how, how, how do you deal with the, the families? What, what did you experience in, in talking to families uh, about these inevitabilities, you know, uh, losing of uh, loved ones, uh, you know, the life that they're going to have to lead and the grief that they're going to have to bear after the death of a, a loved one? How, how was that managed? Yeah, after the, less, the death of a loved one, of course, we're, then we're talking bereavement and grief, uh, the mourning, and uh, people of faith usually appropriate uh, rites, rituals, and, um, and uh, experiences that help to, uh, uh, to help them to memorialize and to connect with, uh, with friends and family, to reassess and, um, and to engage that which is that which is eternal on the journey to that we've, we've discovered points of connection the chaplaincy is about a ministry of presence and listening I would say even the just like a good physician will do a lot of listening listening to the heart right listening to the lungs trying to discern trying to diagnose trying to understand less talking and more listening so that by the time the doctor does speak the patient and the family, well, that physician has their undivided attention because there's a sense that they have an awareness. The chaplain uses that same approach. But I, I would say it's the approach of Jesus. Jesus answered directly only about 30% of the questions he was asked. Like a good diagnostician, he would respond to questions with more questions because he wanted to get to understand this person, to see what, 
where they could truly connect? And what is the glue that's holding their world together? And how can we help them to access it? You know, and that's social glue with their relationships. That's emotional glue because they're just, they're not a collection of symptoms and problems that need to be addressed. They have inner strengths. So how can we help them to draw on that inner strength? The strength of the loved ones and the friends and also their faith. That dynamic which you can't bottle or measure or weigh. Peace, hope, love, goodness, kindness, mercy. But are so much more powerful than the things that you can touch. And that's where spirituality comes in. Many times it involves religion, but for those who aren't, everyone has a spirituality, those ultimate values. So we seek to connect with them and affirm them and engage them. Do you find that um, <clears throat> sometimes the, the, the faith uh, wavers? Uh, have, you, that, have you had the experience where persons would say, uh, why? you know, why my young, especially if it's a young person yes. um, with a chronic illness, why have this have to happen? God, why are you doing these things? Yes. Uh, and even sometimes, all the people, you know, you, you, uh, perhaps even, especially loss of a mother or a yes. parent or a wife or a spouse, yes. uh, you know, why are you, do, why are you taking this person away from yes. me? Uh, how do you, and I noticed that you, you give a lecture on how do you tell uh, bad give news. Uh, bad news to good, to good people. Yes. How, I'm, I'm imagining what that must be like. Yes. Part of it is taking the God approach where God is a good listener. So most prayers are actually about people talking as opposed to God responding. So you create a safe environment where they can be who they are. And if who they are at that moment is an angry person, it's safe to be angry here and to release uh, excuse the, the analogy, but it's like when people throw up physically. Mm -hmm. Just before you throw up, you feel so terrible physically. Then after you do, there's a release mm -hmm. and a certain wellness, even though there's a little bit of distress. Well, sometimes folks will throw up psychosocially and emotionally, spiritually. They release that anger, they release that frustration, the fear, the anxiety, and it's safe to be who you are. And we journey with them and we find that as they carry on this conversation with us and with, with God, they come to the answers. We need not be afraid. It's been very faith affirming that ultimately God is sovereign and I'm a witness to the resources of these beautiful people and the Spirit of God that joins them uh, in their time of trial and trouble. Uh, the ministry of presence. The friend is the person that walks in when many others are walking out or mm -hmm. wanting to. And that's what palliative care does. It's a team that walks in, with each with their own skill set, wonderful physicians like Dr. Ortiz, beautiful nurses in spirit and mind, uh, great social workers, chaplains, trying to gather with this family, with this patient, and find points of connection so that we can work together in the alleviation of suffering and human flourishing. You know, what are the strengths that you can appropriate at this time so that perhaps even your woundedness could be a source of healing? Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Vivera, uh, suffering and pain mm -hmm. must be uh, a terrible ordeal for persons uh, dying, you know, and, and I think uh, I've heard people say, I don't fear uh, death so much as I fear how I'm dying, how I'm going to die, mm -hmm. you know. And I think when you talk about how I'm going to die, you're thinking about uh, the pain and the suffering that would be attendant with, the, you know, your movement towards death. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I noticed that, you know, uh, we have uh, different forms of pain, uh, different types of Pain. I, I don't. I mean, I don't know what it means. I'm gonna, let me just ask you the question. Things like uh, this, uh, this, 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 shortness of breath. Shortness of breath. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So that's what that is. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to figure out what, uh, what kind, what, what, what is the suffering like? What kinds of pains that we'll be talking about? Uh, you know. So first of all, I'll take it part 
part by part. <coughs> okay. uh, pain is the most debilitating uh, symptom yes. that a patient can have. A patient that's in pain does not sleep, does mm -hmm. not eat. Um, they cannot do the daily, activity, daily activities that they do. Uh, on a daily basis. So um, a big part of these patients with chronic illness, and I'm, I'm talking about the cancer patients with multiple metastases, mm. is to get them on a good pain regimen because there's no quality in, in a life filled with pain. So mm. in talking about the holistic approach that Guillermo uh, spoke about, um, I can do the medical part. Um, I'm part of a team. I have my chaplain, I have a social worker and two nurse practitioners. If I go into that room to address pain and, and, and I, I place the patient on a good regimen for their pain, um, but I see some, some psychosocial needs or spiritual needs, I have to ask my chaplain and my social worker to go in there because you can treat a patient's physical pain, but if you don't address the spiritual part or the psychosocial part, I cannot do enough with, with the medications that I give. Mm -hmm. Now, you also spoke about dyspnea. Um, a lot of this, these illnesses like congestive heart failure and, and lung illnesses, um, the patients die of shortness of breath, of fluid in, in the lungs. So um, as the normal course of the illness, which is um, you start being admitted to the, to the hospital over and over again, you're spending more time in the hospital rather than at home. That's a good key to know that we're in the terminal stage of a disease. Mm. And, and really, uh, the only medication that I have to offer at that point um, to give you a dignified uh, passing, not, not symptom, a symptom burden, is, it would be narcotics, um, things like morphine. Mm -hmm. um, we have a comfort measure order set in our hospital when patients are in the end stage of their disease. A comfort? Comfort measure order set. Mm -hmm. And what this entails is um, when we know that the prognosis is poor and no matter how much aggressive treatment we will give you, there is an end to this chronic illness and we know how it looks like, then at that point, why are we doing the lab work? Why are we poking and prodding? Yeah. Um, why are we using catheters in every orifice that we have? Um, the beauty of palliative care is that if you journey with the patient, you're able to know what their wishes are at, at that end point. And that's what we try to do. Um, and the, our guiding force is the patient's wishes, whatever they have expressed that they want uh, during this time. So at certain points, the treatment could be as painful as the disease itself. Is that what I'm hearing? Like when you say things like, why am I poking the the patient mm -hmm. or why am I giving a, a, a catheter? Oh, oh, for sure. There's, yeah. there's actually, um, the Institute of Medicine um, conducted a study across the United States. It's called Dying in America. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. essentially we should be ashamed of the results of this. Our patients that have chronic illnesses, that again, um, it's, a, it's a course that we know that these illnesses have, um, they're dying across our hospitals receiving aggressive treatment. I mean, um, patients that don't have a, a functional status to withhold chemotherapy um, are receiving that last dose. Um, whereas um, we're not choosing comfort care earlier on when we know uh, how it's going to look at the end. So um, that's what palliative care is trying to do. So that's not do. something that you need. Uh, you, what, you, exactly. what you need now is comforting. Exactly. You don't, you don't need treatment for a disease that you're not going to recover from. Exactly. Well, I guess the insurance companies might have something to do with that. Mm. <laughs> we have to take a break for a word from our sponsors. I'm quite fascinated, I'm fascinated with the discussion. Uh, when we come back, perhaps you could talk, continue discussion on the repetitive care and, 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 and the pain and suffering and also planning uh, in terms of assets and, and things that you're going to leave, you know, because I, I don't know how much it happens to your families. But I know here in the Virgin Islands, uh, a lot of times we die and the children and the relatives fight over land and house and assets and it's a mess. And that's those, I, you know, those are things that we need to take, start, we can take a look at uh, if we, we know that we are going to die and before we die. Mm -hmm. We'll come right back with more right after these words from our sponsors. Keep it locked right here to Spotlight. Spotlight is brought to you by the National Bank of the Virgin Islands and CCT Global Communications. Facebook, 
Instagram, you name it, I have it. I use it for my internet, Skype, WhatsApp, YouTube, everything. I can upload photos, share files, have meetings. But data is ridiculously fast. And when they switch to this LTE, wow, the speed is incredible. Unlimited, unlimited, unlimited. I don't have to go, how much data do I have? It's there. The other networks, I could WhatsApp on this one. I absolutely love it. You have to get it, BVI. Thank you, CCT. Life is like a mountain you must climb. Life is like a treasure you must find. A baby learning how to talk. With just one step begins to walk. One step at a time. We lead you to paradise. Your dreams are there to find. One step to paradise. Welcome back to Spotlight. I'm here with Dr. Vivera and Reverend Guillermo, and they're here in the Virgin Islands to give some lectures on end of life and health estate planning. And we're having quite an uh, interesting conversation. These, uh, these lectures, well, one, one lecture was today at uh, 4.30 uh, to 7, and that was for the healthcare providers, and the other lecture is tomorrow afternoon, that's March 16th, tomorrow afternoon, at 6 p.m. It starts at 6 p.m. and it goes to 8 p.m. and you really need uh, to come out. It's going to be about estate planning for end of life. Uh, it's going to be an attorney there, Mr. Terrence Neal, uh, death, dying, and grieving, including advanced directives by Reverend Guillermo Escalona. Uh, general overview of palliative care by Dr. Zulmarie Ortiz Viviera. And of course, you're going to be able to ask questions. It's going to be a 20 minute question and answer. Um, there's going to be a one hour question and answer uh, sex, uh, session. It's, it's going to be held at the Betito Fred building with the training center, uh, the health training, health, 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 health. yes, at the Ministry of Health training room. So you need to you need to come out you need to come out to, to, to hear to get this information. It's gonna be some very, very important information for uh, persons, for families that are gonna be going through uh, end of life experiences with their loved ones or for themselves to prepare for the eventuality because uh, as Reverend Guillermo said, we are gonna die and so we need to be prepared uh, for it. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> so now <clears throat> we were talking, of course, about the, the pain that you know, love, you know, people experience uh, uh, during uh, death. And, and a while back, I can't remember how long ago it was, uh, there was a doctor that, were offer, uh, that, was, that actually got locked up for offering <clears throat> uh, assisted suicide. I think yes. it was Dr. Kevorkian. Dr. Kevorkian, that's who, that's right. Uh, how, does, how does what you're doing uh, mesh with that kind of thinking? Uh, I, I, I know you see a lot of suffering. Mm -hmm. Is that something that should be a consideration that mm -hmm. we should be allowed to decide whether we want to go through that uh, suffering or well, not? It's interesting that you should mention Dr. Kevorkian because <clears throat> a number of the people that he helped to die weren't even terminally ill. Mm. But they were experiencing such emotional and spiritual and social suffering that without him having the necessary uh, resources to test them adequately, 
they appeared to be dying physically as well because they were withering in mm -hmm. spirit. And one of the things that palliative care and hospice care does is to alleviate the suffering so that people will not fall into s such dark despair mm. that they're practically like the soldier wounded on the battlefield and there's no morphine for him or her. There's no, in no way of intervening. So he asks his buddies, just kill me because death has to be better than this pain that I'm experiencing. But if you've got the resources available to address the suffering, we can collaborate with the natural process, the natural dying process, collaborate with the person that's dying, with his or her family and the Creator in harmony so that the death is experienced as a good death, neither prolonging suffering and the dying experience nor needlessly hastening a process, but working with the natural process. Cure may not happen, but in this manner, a healing of sorts can take place, which could be quite meaningful. I also believe that a clarification in terminology is also very important when you're speaking about euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. So euthanasia is when a physician administers a medication to cause death, and that mm -hmm. is illegal. Mm -hmm. Physician-assisted suicide is when a physician writes a prescription that's going to be a lethal agent and you decide as a patient whether you're going to go fill that or not and that's legal in five states. What we do is not physician assisted suicide or euthanasia. These are patients that are dying. It's whether we comfort them during that time or we don't mm -hmm. and that's that's what we're trying to do um, with much of what Reverend Santos is saying is Escalona sorry is saying is that if we have an agent like morphine that can help be twofold with pain and with shortness of breath, um, and, and this is something that is, is very traumatizing when you see a patient die like this. Mm. Um, they're using their abdominal muscles they, they, for their breathing. They're using neck muscles to breathe. They're, this is agonal breathing. This is somebody that's, that's, that's suffering. We have agents to help them, not to, not to hasten death. They do not do this, but they, they comfort the patient through this, through this time. So they reduce the pain, they reduce the suffering. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. Planning uh, for, 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 for death, uh, is that something that we should do from now, even though we are not terminally ill, or we are not um, perhaps, or well, you don't know when you're going to die and what you're going to die from. But <clears throat> when should we start thinking about uh, planning to, estate planning for, for, for death? When, is that, when, when should we start thinking about that? I believe it's, it's a smart idea to, to start without having a terminal illness. I, I mm -hmm. think everybody should have a living will. Start at the same mind. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yes. Non suffering mind. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Unfortunately, exactly. what, what I see in, in, in the patients that I see with chronic illnesses is that there is zero planning because there are a lot of unrealistic expectations. Mm. And I could give you an example. Um, a couple of months ago, I saw a Caucasian a, a female that had lung cancer, had metastasized. She, le she lived alone, wasn't married, didn't have any children. Um, she decided to enroll herself in a nursing home because her family was out of state. She sold her house. She had a plan. Whereas um, Miami is heavily um, Hispanic people are, are, mm -hmm. are there. So when I see a Hispanic person, it's, it's completely the opposite. It's um, no, they're never going to die. Sometimes they even say we don't believe that we have this terminal diagnosis. So what ends up happening is, is sometimes I have family member uh, af family members coming to the hospital after the patient has passed saying, we don't know what to do with the house that was under their name. Now mm. we are homeless. Like this is, this is, it gets very tragic because you are not actively planning the future of the family as a whole. These are things that impact the family completely. Yeah. And I was going to say that in my parents, I had both of those dimensions because my mother was of that perspective that she was going to live forever and my father was always the planner and uh, he he had made the funeral arrangements all of that but he had a friend 
keep them when I was a youngster, and then later he involved me in that process. But I witnessed my mother deal with uh, terminal illness and come to terms uh, with it, and now my father dealing with uh, dementia. And before the dementia took very, a very strong hold of him, it, he was very wise in reaching out to me as his eldest son and asking me to help him to visit an attorney, to make the plans, the, the will, uh, the durable power of attorney, uh, trustee if he ever became so diminished that he couldn't manage his affairs at all, and uh, the living will, the healthcare surrogate, all of those. The healthcare surrogate is a person with whom you've had a conversation, ideally, with whom you've had a conversation and expressed exactly what your wishes would, would be if it ever got to a point where you were unable to make decisions for yourself. So this individual could represent you as your ambassador with the healthcare community and others. And it's a legal pr uh, procedure that you go through in order to have that established? Exactly. And I'm sure the attorney that will be with us tomorrow will be able to address the legal components with reference to our context here. Uh, the uh, living will uh, addresses the uh, terminal uh, prognosis, diagnosis, in our case where uh, two or more physicians uh, are in agreement that the likelihood of survival is uh, per practically nil, mm -hmm. then under those conditions, uh, by completing a living will, in essence the patient says, I would like to be kept comfortable, but I would not like for my life to be prolonged in a manner that is conducive to prolonging my suffering. And uh, so that's the gist of, of mm -hmm. the, living, uh, the living will. I'd like to add to that actually. It's, it's very important who you choose as your healthcare oh, surrogate. Yes. I've seen countless times when a patient has a living will that st states, if I have a terminal illness, if I'm in end stage, I do not want life prolonging procedures, um, meaning I don't want to be on a ventilator and none of that aggressive treatment. And I see healthcare surrogates do it completely opposite. opposite of what the patient and would want. Die, you ever heard of them coming back and haunting them? <laughs> I'm sure there's stories out there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, but how tragic, no? Yes, yes. That uh, yeah. this very, is the person that, let's, let's put myself in that situation. That I put my trust in, in you, let's say we have this conversation. Yes. And I it's explain, awful. please, this is what yes. I would like. Please represent me when I'm not able to. And then you do completely, com completely disobey. Yes. Yeah, that, that's, that's not good at all. No, yeah. no. Mm -hmm. So indeed, as Dr. Ortiz has said, uh, mm -hmm. give careful thought and consideration to the person that you choose to represent you and uh, assure yourself as much as possible that this individual will do that in good faith. That you can, you can trust them to, to, to carry out your wishes. Exactly. Yeah. And exactly. that's a hard decision to make. Yes, of course. Yeah. 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 All right. So, of course, we have the estate planning, as we mentioned. Uh, death, dying, and grieving. Uh, including advanced directives. What, what does all that mean, Reverend Guillermo? Yes, sir. Well, the advanced directives were preci precisely the living will and the healthcare mm -hmm. surrogate. That's the core of the advanced directives. The, the death and, and, and dying and grief component has to do with some of the dynamics that come into play. Uh, even before our death happens, as I shared earlier, when we become aware of our mortality and the fact that we're becoming diminished, we begin to experience, along with our loved ones, uh, anticipatory grieving. There's a sense in which there is an autonomy where we respect the beliefs and the values of the patients, but it's usually an autonomy lived out within the context of relationships. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the families could be quite extended, and they're all grieving together in different ways. Um, Doctor, me, me, Meaning that, uh, oh, he's going to die, or he's, he's going to die, and you just... Oh, that's so sad. It's in, and before he dies, or before the person dies, yeah. you will get in this constant frame of mind of he's going to. Or pushing it away with a, a sense of denial. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and, and sometimes it's an effective denial. I remember uh, once a wonderful thanatologist, this is a, a, a person that is skilled in death and dying and, and treating um, those dynamics uh, holistically. Um, I was always told that uh, denial was the adversary and we needed 
to really have people face the, mm -hmm. the, the straight truth that this is what's going to happen. So this thanatologist comes to town and he says, thank God for denial, sometimes that's all we got. Yeah. And what he was trying to say is, if it's effective, if they're complying with what's best for them, and what they need is a, a respite from being constantly reminded that they have this wound that they're dealing with, you know. But, but that's an aspect of the process. It's, it's hard to believe that this is happening to me. It's hard to believe that this is happening to my loved one. And, uh, and sometimes we have a conspiracy, what we call a conspiracy of silence, which is an unfortunate conspiracy if that's where we stay, because then it's not a respite for a season, like a mental or social vacation mm -hmm. from this reality, where we'd rather talk about something okay. else. Mm -hmm. But it's the tragedy that occurs when we never talk about it. And so everyone is protecting everyone else from the truth that everybody knows. And we miss out on having the full support of our loved ones, having frank and honest conversations. I mean, it's wonderful to tell God the truth in prayer and vent, but even Jesus called his friends to come over and help him out. Peter, James, John, wake up. And yet some of our patients and families are not doing even what the Lord with all of his resources chose to do and that is have a frank conversation I'm hurting I know what's going on you know you can see it let's sit let's talk together and let's help each other through this process we need each other no man is an island and it's a and especially at a time such as this when our resources can be overwhelmed in every way. We need our friends, we need our family, we need to talk about this. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a great um, spiritual and psychological resource uh, that assists with your dying process to yes. have persons mm -hmm. be able to come yes. and, and, and sit with you and talk yes. about it. And It's a magnificent opportunity to give people their flowers before they die. Mm to let them know what's on your heart. Even in terms of estate planning, there was this particular gentleman, every time I visited him, there was one item less. And so I thought somebody was stealing from him. And he said, no, 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 I am enjoying. I am having the pleasure of giving my things away before mm -hmm. I leave this earth. So I get to delight in the expressions and uh, of love as I give to people. So when you have frank conversations uh, with loved ones and friends, not only do you gain support, but you, you gain some other wonderful experiences like the ones that I've described, and you get to celebrate one another and do life review. Uh, we, we want to go back and relive some of our past experiences. Why do that alone? Why not do that in communion, in community? with our loved ones? What could be more spiritual? What could be more delightful? And sometimes at that very point, at the very end, you might get to find out something about the person that you, that had, you didn't know. Yes. Uh, a for, beautiful the whole legacy. Lifetime, for the whole lifetime. Exactly. 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 For the whole, for the for, and then lifetime. it'll pass on from generation to generation, generation like a wonderful treasure yeah. because we were able to talk. Legacy work is, is something that is essential and, and you want to do it when, when they're here. Um, journaling is very important. Sometimes mm -hmm. we have patients that might have uh, the wedding of, of their daughter and they know that they won't make it, but I, I've seen ceremonies when they, they're able to read a, a letter that, that, that they wrote for that day. But if you don't address those important moments that you wish to be a part mm -hmm. of even when you're not here, then, then you don't get the beauty of, of these gifts. Yes. And, and, and to, to record uh, some of the history of the individual as well, because many times our parents die and we don't know who our great-grandparents were, for example, yes. or yes. we don't know how, you know, what kind of life they live in the past, and, 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 and you, you don't have that legacy to remember, mm -hmm. uh, you, don't, you, know, you don't have the knowledge of your foreparents to remember when they're gone, so you don't, you don't have those good memories to help with the grief. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Or mm -hmm. perhaps there was a wish that we could have granted, but we never did because we never talked. Mm -hmm. We had a gentleman at the hospital who had the conversation, and uh, he had a ring from one of the universities, and uh, he shared with the social worker, he said, oh, that's my alma mater. Did you graduate? He said, yes, but I never got a chance 
to participate in the commencement, and I would love to do that. Mm -hmm. And so we reached out to one of the universities. They sent a couple of their deans. We went to the chapel. The family was there. The nurses were there. Doctors were there. And he was given his degree. We had a commencement uh, ceremony. And so, but if you don't have a conversation, how can you accomplish something as beautiful as that? And uh, many other things, yeah. you know, to grant them their, the, the, make a, the make a wish for children. How about the make a wish for the, for the elder yeah. uh, who is so esteemed and everyone could bless them and have uh, whatever it is that they wish. Is there some way to bring that into their room, to bring that into their space and to enjoy that with them? Yeah. We have fallen on the terrain of the club. So, uh, is there anything that um, you would like to mention? We're going to, of course, invite persons down to the training center in the Batito Fred building uh, tomorrow afternoon. That's tomorrow on TV. Uh, the 16th of March, which is Wednesday afternoon, uh, at 6 p.m. And from, it'll be from 6 to 8 to hear the public lectures um, by uh, Mr. Terence Neal, Estate Planning for End of Life, uh, Death, Dying, and Grieving, including Advanced Directives by Reverend Guillermo Escalona, and a general overview of palliative care by Dr. Zulmarie Ortiz Vivera. Uh, we, need to, we need to come out, How to Give Bad News to Good People by Reverend uh, Escalona, Care of the Dying, Care of the Whole Person, by Reverend Escalona, uh, Spirituality in Palliative and End-of-Life Care, again by, Dr. Escal by Reverend Escalona. Uh, those are, those are the, 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 the topics that's going to be covered uh, for the general public on, 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 on Wednesday evening, tomorrow night, uh, at the Training Center, the Betito Fred Building. So, you need to come out and really get a grasp of some of this information. Some of this information so you're able to prepare for your end of life and plan your estate so that you don't um, leave strife at the end of your life. Very good. Thank you for having us. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for being here and thanks for sharing all this info. Very valuable, so valuable information with us. You're welcome. Yes, indeed. Next week, the spotlight will shine on all of the action planned for the Easter festival, the Virgin Gorda Easter festival. It's going to be a very, very uh, good festival. It sounds uh, great. All the, uh, well, not a, not a lot of, 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 of international artists, but certainly enough to make it uh, an interesting event. So we're looking forward to the Easter celebration in Virgin Gorda. Uh, and I think this begins on the 26th of March. We're going to have uh, the members of the committee talking about all the activities that's going to be going on. So be sure to be here uh, with the Spotlight. Spotlight, of course, is seen Tuesdays at 8 p.m. here on JTV Channel 55 and rebroadcast on Sundays at 2.30. You can also watch Spot Spotlight on Demand at jtvlive.net. Uh, please like our Facebook page. I'm not getting enough likes. I know you talk to me about it all the time. You enjoy the show all the time. Just click like when you go on your, web, on your Facebook page. Just go to Spotlight, uh, facebook.com forward slash Spotlight BBI and click like. I'd like to see some more likes on Facebook. You could find out about our upcoming guests and topics so you can suggest guests and topics of your own. I'm at Juanka reminding you that when the Spotlight is on, you see the facts. Peace and blessings. Spotlight is brought to you by... Tortola Concrete Limited, the National Bank of the Virgin Islands, and CCT Global Communications. Welcome to